This sermon is titled The Cross of Jesus Christ The Triumph of the Cross Part 2 Be enriched as you listen This morning just to help us focus and look at the cross and just remind ourselves of what has been accomplished for us on the cross I want to remind us about the triumph of the cross. We began talking about this last Sunday, the cross of Jesus Christ, the triumph of the cross, and we want to spend a little bit more time on that today as we talk about what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. What we're focusing on and pointing us to is that in as much as the cross of Jesus was a place of great trial and pain and suffering, it is also the place of the greatest triumph ever known. It's the place of the greatest triumph ever known. We can say an amen. And so we want to focus in on that and talk about what Christ triumphed over on the cross. A point that I want to bear on our hearts is this, that everything Jesus did on the cross, He did it for you and me. Amen? Everything Jesus did on the cross, He did it for you and me. He didn't need to do the cross for Himself. He was already God. He was already victorious. He was already triumphant. He was King of kings. But everything Jesus did on the cross, He did it for you and for me. Out of love and compassion for you and me. That's why He did it. As we began talking about this over the last several weeks, as we were focusing on the cross, we mentioned that final phrase, that final shout Jesus gave from the cross. He said, it is finished. And that was a shout of victory, a term which when used legally, it meant the case is closed. When used in terms of, you know, in a, in a workplace setting, it meant the work is, whatever I've been sent to do, the work is accomplished. When used in a military setting, it meant we won the battle. The victory is ours. And that's what Jesus shouted on the cross, his final words, when he said, it is finished. The work is completed. The debt is paid. The case is canceled. And the battle's been won. It is finished. It's a place of greatest strength. Now, just going back to the Garden of Eden, we understand that when Adam and Eve sinned, the fall put us all in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. The fall put us all in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. It placed us underneath that. So sin dominated us. Satan oppressed us. And death awaited all of us. No, none of us could escape from either of these three. We were in subjection to sin, Satan, and death. Last Sunday, we talked about the triumph of the cross, how on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ triumphed over sin on our behalf so that you and I need no longer be slaves of sin. We could say boldly with the Apostle Paul, sin will not have dominion over me. For I am not under the law, but under grace. Amen? And today we want to focus on the triumph of the cross over Satan. What did Jesus do on the cross to dismantle Satan's hold over our lives? What did he do? There was a prophecy in the Garden of Eden. The moment Adam and Eve sinned and God had to dismiss them from this beautiful garden, and this place of wonderful fellowship with him. At that moment, God also said something. Galatians, sorry, Genesis 3 and verse 15. God said, I'll put enmity between, he's speaking to the serpent. Satan came through the form of that serpent. So really God is speaking to 
Satan. There is a law of double reference here. In the natural, there's the serpent, but in the spiritual, there is Satan, the law of double reference. So Genesis 3.15, he said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He will bruise or crush your head. You will bruise his heel. Law of double reference. In the natural, people and snakes don't get along too well. But in the spiritual, he's talking about something else. He's talking about the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. He will bruise your head. See, when you want to kill a snake, you don't hit the tail, you hit the head. You look for that one fatal blow that will crush the serpent. And that's what God was speaking about. There's a seed of the woman. There's somebody coming who's going to crush your head. A prophecy given in the garden. Time passed by. Centuries pass by. And the Bible says, in the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent His Son, born of a woman. And so here comes this man, the seed of the woman. But this man is different. This is deity in humanity. This is God Almighty clothed in flesh and blood. This is God walking on the earth. This man is different because this man is unlike all other human beings. He looks like everybody else, but he, he is not subject to sin, Satan, or death. And that puts him apart or sets him apart. This man is not subject to sin, Satan, and death. And he lived a sinless life. Then he went to the cross, where he was nailed to the cross. But it was on that cross that Jesus Christ triumphed over Satan. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, put it like this. It says, inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That means he came in flesh and blood. That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Notice what it says. Through death. He would destroy the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. Through his death on the cross, Jesus Christ has destroyed, rendered powerless the devil, the one who had the power of death. It's rendered him powerless. And that's the triumph of the cross. Amen? You don't seem happy. Through his death, Jesus destroyed the one who had the power of death. That is the devil. Let's say an amen. amen. The devil's been destroyed. The devil's been conquered. He's been defeated. Through that death on the cross, Jesus defeated him. And verse 15 goes on to say this. It says, So that he might release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now think about this verse. Verse 15. Fear always puts us in bondage. Fear is not a healthy thing. Fear enslaves us. Puts us in bondage. 
But here he's talking about the ultimate fear. The fear of death. And he's saying there are people who are so afraid of death that their entire lifetime is spent in bondage. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, Jesus destroyed the devil so that all those who are living their life in bondage to fear, even in bondage to this ultimate fear, the fear of death, he will release them. That he might release those who through fear of death live their entire lifetime in bondage. So the question is, what is your fear? You're fearful of the job interview tomorrow or Monday. What are you afraid of? What is your fear? Every fear, whatever its form, whatever its shape, whatever its area of, of influence in your life, Jesus Christ died on the cross he destroyed the devil, the father of all fears, so that you and I could be released from every, any, and even the greatest fear that could ever torment and oppress man. You don't have to spend one second in your lifetime in subjection to fear because Jesus Christ has conquered the one who dominated and oppressed man with fear their entire lifetime. Can you say an amen? You don't have to be in fear because Jesus has destroyed the one who had the power of death, the one who is the source of fear, the one who torments and oppresses minds and people with fear, all kinds of fear. It's not healthy. It's not from God. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to release us and may, to, may you today experience your release from your fears. Amen. Now, just talk a little bit about his life on earth. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus was prepared for the cross, for the death on the cross. His was a life prepared to conquer through death. Many times during his earthly ministry, Jesus foretold what would happen on the cross. He foretold that he was going to triumph over Satan through death. In John 12, Jesus is recorded as saying this. He says in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. John 12, Jesus is becoming aware that his death on the cross is imminent. He's going to go there very soon. And the agony of that suffering and all that he's going to go through is beginning to set in. And so he begins to pray to the Father. He says, Father, save me from this hour. God, my Father, I know it's going to be terrible. Save me from this hour. And notice his resolve. But for this purpose came I unto this hour. Meaning, I've come for this purpose. He knew his purpose. And he was willing to go there. He knew it. He said, for this purpose I've come. Up until this point, I've come for this purpose, to go to the cross. Then he continues to talk about the cross, but listen to what Jesus said about the cross or concerning the cross. Verse 31, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. I've come for this purpose. I've come to go to the cross. And on the cross, the world will be judged. 
the sentencing of the world will be put upon him. But there is something else that's going to take place. The ruler of this world is going to be evicted. The ruler of this world is going to be cast out. Jesus knew the great triumph of the cross. He knew on the one hand the judgment of all your sin and mine will be put upon him. But in that process something else is going to happen. The God of this world, the devil who dominated you and me is going to lose his hold over you and me. He said now the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. And then he continues talking about the cross. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But this he spoke, next verse, concerning his death. So I being lifted up, talking about him being raised up on the cross. And he said, if I'm going to be raised up on that cross, I'm going to touch every nation. I will draw all men unto me. He was declaring the triumph of the cross. Amen. Give me the name of one human person, of one person who through his death would Achieve such a great victory. Who through his death could say the ruler of this world is cast out. And I will draw all men to myself. If I die this death on the cross. But that's what Jesus said. Are you listening? He said if I be raised up. I will draw all men. I will draw all people to myself. A little later in John, the 14th chapter, the 30th verse, Jesus said, The ruler of this world is coming, but he has no place in me. He's coming, but he's got nothing in me. He's not going to be able to touch me in any way. He has nothing in me, no claim in me. And in John 16 verse 8, he once again spoke about the fact that the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is sentenced. So on three separate occasions, Jesus foretold the great triumph of the cross. He foretold his victory over Satan on the cross. He said the ruler of this world is cast out. He's coming, he's got no hold on me. He's not going to be able to do anything to me. And the ruler of this world is judged. So the cross is that place of great triumph. Let's take a closer look at the cross. It was a cruel death. But it was a death that crushed the enemy. It was a painful death. It was an agonizing death. But it was a death that was Satan's final blow. It's amazing. The Apostle Paul records it like this. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 and 15, he says, Having blotted out the handwriting of offenses against us. And taking it out of the way. Nailing it to his cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. What's he saying? He's, he has, he's, he's painting a picture of a list of offenses. The handwriting of requirements, the King James Version says. But if you look at it, Colossians 2.14, keep it on the screen, please. If you look at it, in a legal sense, it's the list 
of your offenses and mine. Here's the list of all your crimes. If you look at that term in a financial sense, this is your ledger, your accounting statement. And it says you are bankrupt and you owe all of this. If you look at it in a moral sense, this is the list of all of God's commands that you've broken. Commandment number one, broken. Commandment number two, broken. Commandment number three, broken. That's your list. And Paul is saying that he blotted this list out. He took it out of the way. And he nailed it to his cross. So try to picture this in your mind if you can. Pilate made sure as it was customary to do, that Christ's criminal charges were nailed right there on the cross in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And his charges was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews, nailed to the wooden cross. But in the spiritual realm, there was something else that was nailed on the cross. Your list of offenses. The list of all your crimes, all my crimes. God Almighty was nailing it to the cross. And he said, these are all the sins of Ashish. These are all, this is account statement. The, the bankruptcy. These are all his debts that he owes. This is a list of all the commandments he has broken. In the realm of the Spirit, God Almighty, He nailed it to the cross of Jesus Christ so that the Paul, Apostle Paul could write, He blotted this out, meaning that list became clean. There's nothing else, nothing left on that list. He blotted everything out. He said he took it out of the way, meaning there is no more list against you. It's non-existent. It's gone. Tell your neighbor, it's gone. <laughs> it's been taken out of the way. Your list of crimes is gone. Your list of debt that you owe is gone. Your list of broken commandments is gone. It's been blotted out. It's been taken out of the way. Why? It was nailed to the cross. You're saying, why are you making such a big deal of this? It's a big deal. Because that list of offenses is what gives the jailer the right to keep you in prison. When you take the prisoner to the jail, and you hand him, these are the charges against him. Keep him locked up. It's that list of crimes. It's that list of offenses that holds you in prison. And that's the reason Satan could hold you and me in bondage. That's the reason Satan could be your oppressor and mine. That's why you and I were in subjection to Satan. That's why we were held captive by the enemy of our souls. Because in heaven there was an unpaid debt. In heaven there was a list of crimes against us. In heaven there was a list of all the commandments you had broken. And that's what gave him the right to hold you and me captive. But I want you to know, there's no more list in heaven against you. There is no more list of broken commandments against you in heaven. There is no more list of your crimes in heaven. It's been blotted out. You are free. The enemy has no claim over you, no hold over your life, no more right to keep you in bondage. Because it's gone. It was taken out of the way on the cross. Because Jesus nailed it to the cross. Are you listening? Your list of offenses is gone. Your list of unpaid debts is gone. Your list that says, the letter that says you're bankrupt, it's gone. That list of broken commandments is gone. It's non-existent. 
And so Paul continues about the cross, verse 15 of Colossians 2. He says this, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in the cross. So here's the next thing Jesus did on the cross. He disarmed principalities and powers. Principalities and powers is a Bible term to refer to Satan and all his cohorts. To refer to Satan and all his demon spirits. Colossians 2.15 says that on the cross, Jesus disarmed them. And he made a public spectacle of them. And he triumphed over them on the cross. Satan's been disarmed. The devil's been disarmed. You can say an amen at least. <laughs> Satan's been disarmed. He has nothing left. Colossians 2.15. He has disarmed principalities and powers. And he made a public spectacle of them. And in his mind, the Apostle Paul, writing there in Bible times, he has this picture of this image of a triumphant general. The general and his armies, they have fought a wonderful, victorious battle. And they have conquered the enemy. And now they are taking or going on a procession, a parade. There's the general in front, triumphant, and all his soldiers behind him, victorious. And right after that is that defeated enemy, humiliated in chains, disarmed, naked. That king that has been conquered and all his soldiers walking in procession. And just picture in your mind, all the civilians, they didn't go into battle. But they are cheering. And you can imagine some of them are coming and joining the procession. That's you and me. You and I are joining that triumphant procession. Because Isaiah 52 verse 12, Isaiah said, He will divide his spoil with the strong. In other words, he will say, come on in. Join the procession. We're leading Satan and all his courts in this triumphant procession. You and I are there. We're running in. We're the civilians. We didn't do this battle. We did not fight. But we are in this triumphant procession. Stand up on your feet, please. And say, I am in this triumphant procession. Come on. Stand up on your feet. You don't seem to believe God's word this morning. <laughs> say this with me. I am in this triumphant procession. I am marching. In Christ's triumphant procession, Satan and his cohorts are behind us, naked, disarmed, chained, powerless. I am marching in Christ's triumphant procession. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. That is it. He disarmed principalities and powers. And he made a public spectacle of them. And you and I joined that procession. He made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them on the cross. Amen. When you're going through some sickness. Yes. There is some sickness and pain that you're going through. But there's a greater reality that you can live out of. The greater reality is that Jesus Christ has already triumphed over whatever is troubling you. If you're going through some hardship, some trouble, yes, I'm not, you're not living in denial. But there's a greater truth. There is a greater reality. And the greater reality says that on the cross, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers. And he triumphed over them. He made a spectacle of them. And he triumphed over them on the cross. And you and I are part of Christ's triumphant procession. 
That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the apostle Paul, using that same image, he applies it to you and me, and he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphant procession, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. The same image applied here. So let's say this to God, together. Thanks be to God. He always leads me. In triumphant procession. Because I'm in Christ. See, that victory on the cross can never be altered. That victory on the cross can never be undone. That victory on the cross can never be changed. That triumphant procession has been established for eternity. And you and I are positioned in Christ's triumphant procession. You and I have no option but to walk triumphantly. That's why Paul says, thanks be to God, who always, always in your sickness, always in your financial troubles, always in problems you're facing, always, he always leads you in triumphant procession in Christ. Amen? And that took place 2,000 years ago on the cross. He finished the work. So whatever you're facing, you have to affirm, you have to believe, and you have to declare, I am in Christ's triumphant procession. That cannot change. That cannot change. I am marching in Christ's triumphant procession, and God always causes me to triumph in Christ. Amen. And so in Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15 that we looked at, Paul deals with both these things, the list of charges against us and this triumphant procession that you and I are privileged to participate in. So believer, you and, you and I, we must know that Satan and his demons are disarmed, they are crushed, and they are defeated. Amen. Satan and his demons are disarmed. They are crushed and they are defeated. It's very interesting. The apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8. He said, and again here there's a double reference. He said, if the rulers of this age, and he's talking about the wisdom of God here. He says, if the rulers of this age had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known what was actually going to take place on the cross, they would not have crucified him. Again, double reference. There is the natural, which is the physical rulers. But there is also the reference to the rulers of darkness. The powers of darkness. If they had known what was going to happen on the cross, they would not have put Jesus there. Because when they thought that they had done with him, they didn't realize he was defeating them. He was conquering them. And so also today, whether it's governments or whether it's anyone else, they think we're done with Jesus. They don't know that in every blow you deal to Jesus, it comes back. Harder on you. Amen. That's all that happens. It happened up there 2,000 years ago and it still happens. The rulers of this age, they don't know what they're doing when they try to deal a blow to Jesus Christ. Amen. So, on that cross... There's something amazing happened. The blood was shed. And the blood was the ransom that was paid. So we have been ransomed by the blood. We have been ransomed by the blood. 
The picture the Bible, the New Testament paints about redemption is that of slaves being held captive in captivity by their overlord. And the only way you can purchase their freedom is by the paying of a ransom. Satan held us captive because of this list of charges against us, because of our unpaid debt of sin, because of our all the broken commandments. He could hold us captive. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, He, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So He shed His blood. And the picture the writer of Hebrews paints is this. That Jesus took his own blood and he entered into the most holy place in heaven. And his blood obtained eternal redemption. That means his blood annulled Satan's claim over us. Because his blood removed all of these offenses against us. His blood says, paid, paid, paid. List of crimes, paid. List of debt, paid. List of broken commandments, paid. Satan, no more hold on them. No more hold on them. He entered into heaven with his own blood. And that blood obtained our redemption. Our freedom from Satan's hold. So the blood of Jesus Christ is so powerful. Because that's the ransom price that was paid. That annulled Satan's hold on you. When you say, I believe in the blood of Jesus. When you say, I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus. When you say, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. You're telling the devil, devil, you've got no more hold on me. And the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of, overcome the adversary. By the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. You got to testify. You got to say what the blood of Jesus has done for you. You have to say, I'm redeemed by the blood. I'm washed by the blood. I'm purchased by the blood. The blood of Jesus is on my life. Satan, you've got no place in me, no hold on me. Because the devil knows it's that blood that obtained your redemption. Are you listening? So he went into heaven with his own blood. And he obtained your redemption and mine. Verse 15, please come. I want to spend a few moments just emphasizing this. That the triumph of the cross is for us to live in. Jesus did not do that great work of, on the cross and breaking the power of sin and destroying the power of Satan so that you and I could continue to be under sin or under Satan. No. He did it so that we could live in the reality of it. That we could live in the reality of our life over sin. And you and I could live in, our, in the reality of being victorious over Satan. So as a believer, the reality is, the truth is, you don't have to be subject to sin or Satan. No. Because Christ triumphed over sin and over Satan on the cross. The only weapons or the few weapons that the enemy has Having been disarmed, his weapons are simply these. Fear, intimidation, lies and deception. 
and temptation to get us to go into sin. That's all. Intimidation tries to make us fearful. Deception, he's a father of lies. And temptation, he tries to induce us to sin because sin opens up the door for him in our lives. These are the only three weapons he has. All he can do is what in modern terms we call guerrilla warfare. He has no big weapons. He's been disarmed. So he uses this little actually weak, worthless things of intimidation, deception, and temptation. That's all he has. That's his bag of tricks. He has no weapons. He's got a bag of tricks. The reason why so many of us as God's people are still serving under sin and under Satan is because we don't know the truth. God said in the Old Testament, Hosea 4, 6, Isaiah 5, 13, He said, My people are gone into captivity because of a lack of knowledge. Our problem is not we don't have good worship or good churches. We don't have knowledge. And the ignorance puts us in subjection to Satan. Ignorance puts us in a place of captivity. That's why Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Satan's got just a little bag of tricks. He's actually been disarmed. He's actually been dethroned. He's actually been evicted. He's afraid of you because you're the one who's got the sword, not him. He's afraid of you because you're the one who's got the shield, not him. He's afraid of you because you're the one under the blood. But all he has is a bag of tricks. And it's so sad to see the church seemingly suffer under a disarmed, defeated, crushed, badly bruised, evicted enemy. It's time we woke up to the truth. It's time we embraced the truth. It's time we said, this is what my Jesus has done for me and this is what I'm going to live in. It's time you and I rose up with courage, with boldness, with confidence in our hearts that none of us would be afraid of any demon. None of us would be afraid of any devil. If the devil sees us, it's he who's going to be on the run, not me, not you. Amen? Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Christ has conquered the enemy. What are you facing today? Yes, in this world, there's an enemy that's working. There are people who are doing evil things. Yes, we understand that. But you are the one who is in the victory procession. You're there. You're going to walk in victory. So whatever you face, you face it as a winner. You face it through the reality of Christ's finished work on the cross. You face it through the reality that Christ has triumphed over Satan. Christ has triumphed over sin. And Christ has given, completed an amazing work on the cross. And He gave it to you and me. And you walk in that reality. Enforce that victory in your own life, in your family, in your children. In, in, in anything that concerns you, you enforce that victory. Satan will try his tricks. He'll try to lie to you that you will never make it in life. He'll try to lie to you that you, you will never come out of your problems. He will try to lie to you that you have to live in bondage to sin. He will try and lie to you. That's his bag of tricks, his deception, lies. But you stand up with the truth and you say, no, I'm coming out victorious. Jesus has triumphed over the enemy. I am coming out victorious out of this sickness. I am coming out victorious over this sin. I am coming out victorious over these troubles that I'm facing. I am coming out victorious. My family is blessed. My home is blessed. Everything I do is blessed because Jesus obtained that for me on the cross. Be a mighty warrior in the spirit. Are you understanding? 
speak to the devil. He's one being you can use harsh words against. Get out. No place here. You don't need to be polite to the devil. That's one person you don't say please and thank you and sorry to. Take the sword of the Spirit against the enemy. Amen? Let's rise to our feet. The triumph of the cross is for us to live in. We are thankful for the cross. We are thankful for what Jesus did for us on the cross. We stand in that finished work and we say, God, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord. The worship team is just going to lead us and as they lead us, let your heart sing to the Lord. Be grateful, thankful for what He's done. To 
will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me and with the ransomed in glory his face I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me oh how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall a few moments to pray before we close the Bible teaches us that each one of us must have personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to receive to experience what he did for us on the cross mommy can't do it for you daddy can't do it for you you have to have your faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. If you have never made a personal decision to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because He is the only one who died for you, who died for all of us, our sins. He was buried. He rose up again. He's alive today. He's a living God. And he's the only one who did that. But you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for you to be saved, for you to experience personally everything he did on the cross. And if you've never done that in your life, maybe you're here this morning, some friend invited you, maybe you're watching online. And if you in your life have never up until this point prayed a prayer and said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to live for you the rest of my life. If you've never done that before, I'm going to lead us in a simple prayer. And I want to invite you to pray this with me if you've never done this. So we're going to do that first. And then after that, I'm just going to pray over all of us to enforce this victory that we heard about, to enforce it in our lives. And I want you to be are receptive to that and expect God to do wonderful things. But first, let's pray this. If there's anyone here you've never prayed to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to give you the opportunity. You can pray this with me, please. If you've never done this before, just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I believe you died for me on the cross. You took my sin. You broke sin's power and you defeated Satan on the cross. I believe you died and you rose again and you're alive today. I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. Now pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is anyone here, you prayed, this prayer, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in your life. 
We want to celebrate with you. Is anyone here, you pray this prayer with me. Let me see your hand, please. Just wave your hand at me. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. Anyone? Just raise your hand. Wave it at me. I can't. Anyone at the back? Just, I see one hand there. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just wave it at me, please. Anyone? You pray this prayer with me for the very first time. Can we see your hands? Can I see your hand? Usher, just look around because I might miss somebody. So if you pray this prayer with me, just wave your hand and ushers will come to you and give you a, what we call as a new believer's bag. There are some free resources in that bag that we want you to have. And there's a card that says decision card. So if you could please put your name and number on that card and give it back to the ushers and somebody from the church office will call you. They'll guide you on how to use those resources in the bag. So once again, if you pray that prayer with me for the first time today, you haven't received the bag yet, then please raise your hand. We just want to make sure you get it. Just make sure everyone else, everyone has got this. Okay. There are some more hands. I'm not sure. I can't see every hand here. But please, ushers, make sure that whoever has raised their hand receives this bag. Okay. And uh, please get the card from them so we can call them and follow up with them please thank you thank you in case uh, an usher didn't come to you but you pray that prayer they will be at the exit so you can just go to any one of them who has this badge there and just tell them hey i didn't get that bag and they'll make sure they give it to you now we're going to pray and i'm just going to pray over all of us as a as, an, as a gathering but we want to enforce christ's victory in each of our lives. So if the enemy has gained entrance in any form, any fashion, is troubling you, either in sickness, mental, physical sickness, mental, whatever, causing problems in your home, your marriage, your family, whatever, I want, I'm just going to pray from here and I want you to come into agreement with me. Let's all come into agreement and say, God, we as a people, we want to walk in the triumph of the cross. We want to walk in the full blessings of the cross we want to walk in the provisions of the cross and so god we receive it we receive it let's pray together come into agreement let's pray pray for every person here everybody you pray in tongues if you can pray for people in this place father god in the name of jesus we bring every person here in this auditorium every person watching online god we bring them under your presence and we god take authority in the name of jesus i take authority over every evil work of the enemy satan you know the truth we know the truth we stand upon the truth and in the name of jesus we come against every sickness every disease, every spirit of infirmity, and we command you foul, unclean spirits to leave in the name of Jesus. We take authority over every spirit that holds people in bondage to addictions, to abnormal behaviors. We take authority over every spirit that torments and oppresses people in the night, that gives them a, a, a terrible dreams and nightmares, that causes them to be oppressed in fear out you spirits in the name of Jesus you spirits will have no hold on their bodies and in their minds in Jesus name every spirit that's causing torment and oppression I command you to leave in the name of of Jesus Christ. I come against every demonic power that hinders people in their businesses, that hinders people in their workplaces, that is hindering people in their finances. I command you to let go. I command that you to stop your work. I declare that the people of God under the sound of my voice are under the blood of Jesus. I declare that the people of God under the sound of my voice, they are under God's covenant. They are under the blessing of God. Their families are blessed. Their workplaces are blessed blessed. Everything that they set their hands to is blessed. Their businesses are blessed. Their workplaces are blessed. And so in the name of Jesus, I command you, devil, take your hands off of God's property. Take your hands off of their work. Get, take your hands off of their families. Take your hands off of their children. Take your hands off of our homes. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare Christ's triumph in every home, in every family, in every household, in every workplace. We declare Christ's victory, Christ's triumph and force. We declare God's people 
will walk under the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. We declare they will walk in health. We declare they will be prosperous. We will declare that they are victorious, that they are overcomers. They walk in the righteousness and the peace and in the joy of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare this over them. We declare in force in their lives. We declare this as their reality because God's Word says so. And everybody said, Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. So be it in your life. So be it in your family. So be it in your home. So be it in your body. So be it in your mind. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to close. And uh, our pastors are here. So I request our pastoral team to come up here. Just make yourselves available. If you need personal prayer, you can come to any one of us. Uh, we'll be here right after we dismiss. We can pray with you. Uh, just quick reminders. Tomorrow is Saturday. We have the weekend school. Uh, if you love to come to a weekend school, please register. You can come. Uh, tomorrow we have the weekend school on the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, myself and some of our pastors will be ministering tomorrow. So do come. You can come in person to the church office or join us online. Details are on our church website. Sunday, Easter Sunday, all services will happen as usual. Right? So please go to the location, oh, except for East. Um, East, we, we don't have the venue, so East people, those of you who worship at East, you're welcome to come here or just connect online. But all other locations will happen as normal on Easter Sunday. We'll have two services here, an 8 o'clock service and a 10.30 service. 10.30 service on Easter Sunday is going to be special because our children are going to be ministering to us. All right? Let's give them all a good hand, the children. All right, so excited about that. Easter Sunday, children have a special role to play. So they're going to be doing something special. And of course, there will be a, a short message on Easter Sunday. So please look out for that. We're going to close. And our pastors will be available right after this. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.